This week in NSFW, Justin premieres a brand new project, and we have Mark Marin from WTF, the number seven most popular comedy podcast on the internet. It's going to be a killer show. Stick around. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for NSFW is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is NSFW for January 12th, 2010. NSFWTF. For those of you audio listeners, you're about to see a rooster. For NSFW, the new show full of win, or as somebody sent in this week, now some fun wankers. And we couldn't decide when we got this if it was now some fun wankers or now some fun wankers. No, uh, it should have a comma after fun, because it's definitely now some fun wankers. Okay, well, all right, well, that's fine with me. By the way, that is my inimitable co-host, Justin Robert Young of iTricks and WeirdThings.com fame. How you doing, Mr. Justin Robert Youngification the first? Listen, I am very, very happy to be here, but please waste no more time with me and get to the guest. All right, so let's talk about this. First of all, Mark Marin, this is a very special edition of NSFW. This is not NSFW because we have Mark Marin from WTF, and I realized that essentially what we got is NSFWTF with Mark Marin. I did that for you. I was very proud of that graphic. Nice. I don't know that he's very excited about it, but we did. It's excellent. You guys are doing all kinds of things I don't even understand. Like, uh, I'm on TV and I'm on a podcast and you're doing things live and people are talking. You're way beyond anything I can even, you know, comprehend or, or think I can. failing do. grandly the entire time <laughs> as we are wont to do on this show. Exactly. We, we are taking those few extra steps beyond the border of your comprehension. But we are, we are you know, how many stumbles, falls and, uh, you know, absolute mishaps. Had to have happened before we got there. All right, that's, 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 oh, absolutely. I, when I did the live internet show with, uh, you know, with Sam Cedar on Break Room Live, when you do what you guys are doing, you it's almost like you have to reinvent television every day from the ground up. But and like that everything one of the is exciting separate. Things. And who knows what's going to go wrong? Like, yeah, literally, we have to re and we have to rediscover all of television and do it on no budget at all. Like, literally, right. half of these cameras are balanced on boxes of software that I bought previously. And in, yeah. and to me, part of me that's that's what has me so excited about all of podcasting. And you're you're jumping ahead because actually that was one of the things I wanted to talk to you about. It. Oh, well, we'll talk about it now. It, how did you end up starting your podcast? Because you're hugely successful. You're number number seven on iTunes. Uh, kicking ass and taking names. What what made you decide to go there? Well, uh, desperation. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, what 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 happened was that really, you know, I, after doing all that I've done in comedy and doing the radio for a couple of years, and we tried to do this show uh, that was sponsored, uh, uh, internet TV show, and it was just I got tired of working for people. So my partner, the dude who has been producing me on radio, and he's a you know good friend of mine, a real whiz in terms of sound and audio, we said. Well, you know, let's just do it. Let's let's make one and put it up and see what happens. And we really weren't expecting anything, but we were just hoping to get a few of my uh, my radio fans to to come to the podcast. And we, it just sort of blew up a bit. And we love doing it. It's great. It, the thing that attracts me to it is that I can say whatever I want. I can do whatever I want. I can talk to whoever I want. And no one can tell me what to do or who to talk to or when to stop or what I can say. Or there's no context other than what we decide. And we're just having a great time. You know, he does a lot of the sound stuff. I do all the the guests and, and the comedy stuff. And we're just, we're having a blast. And we just, uh, we're doing it because we, it's the best format I've ever 
I've ever participated. Well, in. And I, I think you nailed it because it's a case where you've removed so many barriers that you realize it's only after you start dealing with podcasts and dealing with your audience directly that you realize how inefficient traditional media is in terms of radio and television, where it's like you have to have sponsors and you have to have such a gigantic audience in order to support it. And there's so many people who have to pay other people who have to pay other people before you're able to make enough of a salary. You have to have such a ridiculously giant audience just to have a moderately successful show in traditional media. Whereas with one tenth of that crowd, if you have a passionate fan base and you connect with them in a way that's meaningful and you could get two or three sponsors and all of a sudden you'll be making the same amount of money that you did when you were doing traditional media. Is that, has that been your experience? Well, I, 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 I'm waiting for that same amount of money, and I believe what you're saying. Uh, <laughs> well, and, and, but, and keep in mind, that's the other thing, is we're all we're all doing this just on faith. None of us actually knows for sure, but that certainly seems to be well, the it, vibe that we're all working under. Here's what I found, is that I do a very, you know, raw type of uh, of radio. I always have. And, you know, it's, it's funny. I'm a comedian by craft and by profession, but I like to talk about things, and I like to talk to people about things and I don't like being constricted to, you know, what's this guest plugging, you know, you know, what, you know, where's the funny in this? I like the freedom of it. And I think what you're talking about, the bond that you can make with a listener is it's, it's, it, there's nothing like it because if you're honest and you connect with people, it's just you and them. They're either sitting there at their computer, they're sitting in their car, they're on the, uh, on the Stairmaster, whatever's going on. And I, my biggest problem right now, yeah, I, it's not so much the money, that I'm concerned with. I, I want the show to be as good as it possibly can be, but I also want to connect with, like if people write to me or people, you know, uh, email me, I will talk to them. So I'm a little overextended emotionally right now because I, I <laughs> want to have this, this relationship with my fans, but, uh, but I hope it works out the way you're working it. I just like the freedom of it. And I'm very excited that people are digging the show. Cause it's not on, it's not like any other show really. Now, Mark, what, how long have you been doing the podcast now? I guess we're, we're, so what do we got about 36 of them up there? Uh, divide cow. that by eight. So about four months. Okay. So you're relatively new at it. You know, what is the biggest difference, uh, you know, that, that you coming out of radio that you really, really, really wanted to completely disregard when doing your, you know, the, the, the WTF project in particular? Well, the, the whole idea with radio is, is you're, you're, you're basically doing this, this, what do you call it that? I, I mean, I was not, you know, I was only a radio guy for a few years and I, I was, uh, you know, I was pretty new to that, but this sort of forward momentum, the teasing towards a break and then this illusion of an hour of radio where you have six minutes of horrendous commercials, radio commercials are the worst, most, you know, low class, most embarrassing bits yeah. of, 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 of audio that anyone could imagine. So matter, no matter what you were saying or what you were talking about or how great the radio was, you know, you go to you got to go to that three minute gold spot, or you know, foot <laughs> cream, or you know, ridiculous. Uh, and and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with people promoting whatever they're going to promote, but I just like that. No, uh, it, it, it is its own like subsection of hell. Radio ads. It, it, it really, is, it it really below is. on and the it, evolutionary chart than even, like late night CNBC yeah, ads. It wasn't even that big of a problem for me. I just like being able to talk about whatever I want to talk about in every, any kind of language I want and let the, the engagement happen, not because you're going, la, 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 here's a commercial, but because the conversation or the content is actually By the engaged. way, we're very good at the ha, la, 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 la part. It's yeah. all the other parts, the professional parts that we're still working on over here. Before we before we actually talk more about the show, because I, I told you before we actually started the show and the chat room heard me, so you know I'm not lied here. Like when, when I heard that we got you booked for the show, I was super stoked because I had seen your face everywhere because iTunes is heavily promoting you right now, which is awesome. And I uh, listened to one episode and I figured I'll give it one. I'll see what I like it. Liked it instantly, went back and listened to two more. And there's actually a couple of things that I heard you do that I cannot imagine – I've ever heard anywhere else. We'll talk about those later on. This is, see, I'm teasing for later. But first, for those of you guys who don't know, uh, Mark Maron has a very long, very illustrious career as a stand-up comic. Okay, well, so we thought we'd take a look Jesus at one of your bits right here. I'm not having an argument with you. And, you know, with your strange Christian confidence, go forth and fucking do what Jesus does. All right, well, you just love Jesus. You like a dead Jew that supposedly did some tricks. I appreciate that. You look, I'm not going to argue with you. I mean, I, you know, I can believe what I believe. You can believe what you believe. I don't believe what you believe. And I will give you that Jesus was one of the great Jewish magicians. And there is a history. There's a history of Jewish magicians. 
Uh, Harry Houdini was a Jew. Um, his real name was Weiss. I was impressed David you knew that, by the way. Of course, classic Jew, magician. They just took their careers in a different direction. They did not want the pressure that Jesus put himself through. I, I don't really have a point here. I guess what I'm saying is, <laughs> yes, Jesus could walk on water, but if he fell in wearing a straitjacket, could he get out? Could he? <laughs> So, so here's what I love about that clip. And, and it looked to me like this was a spontaneous riff on something somebody had said in the audience. Is that correct? Most of it. Okay. Well, like, like I love that moment where, and, and if it's an illusion, then kudos to you on the illusion. But it's like you throw everything out there, you throw all the threads together, and then at the end there's this pause of the moment. You're like, ah, Jesus could walk on water, but then, you know, could he escape if his, in a straitjacket? Was that pre-written or was that a spontaneous moment right there? Well, there— I, I know that part, that bit has evolved into more of a bit. Like, I do all my writing on stage. Everything that happens in my act was delivered to me on stage. I don't know exactly if that was the night. But to be quite honest with you, that was not a great audience. There was not that many people there. And somebody shot that as this big idea. And I had no control over, you know, that going out. Uh, you know, on the internet, as as we don't really have control over a lot of things now. And it's weird because a lot of people see that, and I, I've done that that bit better. And I've also, you know, I had a better disposition uh, in some other, you know, bits, but I got no control over that being out there. And that that joke, the first half of that was improvised, and I'd been working on the the Jesus magician joke for a while, and now like the tag isn't even the same. Right. Uh, well, now it's become uh, it's become about David Blaine somehow. Well, and, and I don't know <laughs> if uh, uh, Justin, did you tell him about either of our our backgrounds before you booked him for the show? No, 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 no. Okay. Bri Brian is actually a magician, and I, I cover the magic industry for. Yeah, a literally, Justin is is the editor for for like uh, the number one magic news news site, itricks.com, and I've spent the last ten years touring colleges, doing a magic show where I eat fires and stick nails in my eyes, that kind of thing. So I it's got like a buddy I who's a magician. What's that? My buddy's a magician. Who's your buddy? Who? Uh, Andrew Golden Hirsch. Oh no, we uh, oh, no, yeah. I know. Golden hands. Oh my gosh, Andrew Golden Hirsch. Uh, 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 saying he's a magician does not does does not do his talent justice. When a guy can fold up a dollar bill and make it look like a butterfly, and then cover it in his hands and open it up, and there's a freaking living butterfly that flies off in the room. That's he'll take magic. A, he'll take a, 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 a rabbit out of his hair. But you know what I notice about him is that like I'll go to lunch with him. And like, you know, when he eats, he has magician hands. Oh, you know, yeah. So <laughs> that delicate, that delicate. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's everything. It's almost like, you know, I, I he eats very slowly and I always think something else is going to happen. Yeah. you you're way, He's so <laughs> deliberate in the way he handles everything that it's like you get that down. Yeah. yeah. But I was, uh, yeah, I was impressed that you actually knew something about about magic. And the other thing that you said that really interested me, because I've always saw, seen it as a weakness in myself, I feel like there are some people who can sit down with a blank piece of paper and they have a vision in their mind of something they think would be funny or they think what would be a good magic routine and they just write it out. And the way they write it out is the way they perform it on stage. And I've never been one of those guys. I've always thought that I'm a refiner. I can't even begin with a blank, blank piece of paper. I need a giant block of marble that happens to have a twist in a weird way. And I could kind of think maybe I see a shape in there and I keep refining, chipping it away, performance after performance until finally after eight years, I'm just like, holy crap, this is what was in there the whole time. Is, is that how you see it? Well, the, the way I work, I and, and I don't, excuse me, necessarily recommend it, is that I, I've never been a joke writer. I can do it if I have to. Like if I if I do Tough Crowd when that was on or I do a panel show where they have topics, I know how to write jokes for myself. But usually I find all of my stuff on stage. I start with an idea. Like, I wish I could show you how. Like, I can't even really, like, I can't even read my writing. <laughs> like, I, like, I write yeah, things but like this, and I don't know what this says. So, like, there's all these different steps to me. I'll write an idea, then I have to spend an hour trying to figure out what I wrote. You're just, you're so it's just almost like, like dealing with an ancient text of some kind. You're yeah, just I was like, just going to say, for, for those of you who are listening to this, uh, Mark just held up a piece of paper that looks like if you could write Sanskrit in cursive. Right. Uh, and, and, you know, and, I, oh, and I never fix it. Like, I've got notebooks, you know, full of this, you know, cryptic scribble. And, and, and then, like, I'll find the idea, and usually it's just pressing. Like, the thing that makes me write new material is I get so sick of my old material, I have to talk about something. And then I'll bring it on stage, and I'll start the conversation. And over a period of a week or two, it starts to, you know, if I'm, if I'm committed to it, it'll start to take, I'll find the beats where the laughs are. And then it grows over, over years. 
I just got delivered a punchline on stage for a joke about racism that I had been sitting there for six months. And it, it was, the idea was funny. I was getting a laugh on the setup. And then one day it's just like, bing. And I'm like, thank you, comedy God. And that's, <laughs> that's, that's how I write. And like in the podcast is good for that too. Cause I go through a lot of ideas on there that aren't jokes, but they're conversations. That's why I like radio is you're not beholden to this mass brain of, of, uh, of people that are sitting right in front of you that, you know, require that you dangle keys in front of them and, until they're entertained, but you can actually thoroughly, you know, move through thought process. Well, and I, and I tell you, there's actually a nod back to those days of live performance in that, in that, in a weird way, the audience is really on your side. We, we continuously, we call our chat room, our, our writers, our staff writers, because what'll happen is, is just immediately like people like, for example, like Colleen, our producer is, is encouraging my, uh, my new intern, Chad to run away because she's accusing me of being a pedophile. So thank you for that. But like, uh, literally, there we like, go. See, that's the kind of top quality writing that we get out of the chat room. <laughs> when you have Man, a you staff guys are agent, a that works for free. But it's like, we'll cut over. And a lot of times, those those great one liners, those things that happen just in the moment when you couldn't have planned them any better than they just came out, like these guys are full of them. And most of the, you know, maybe a lot of them are crap. But at that one moment, you could steal a line and, so. and pitch it out. And then you have to go back and say, that wasn't me. That was the chat room because it's live. Well, I, live I had a thing that happened on, uh, uh, like, on my podcast, the last one I did, you know, I talked to Doug Benson and we were talking about Twitter and like, you know, I, I, you know, I made a stink about, you know, getting involved with this Comedy Central uh, stand up showdown thing. Yeah. Because like, yeah, I don't really care. You know, I don't. It's just that like I've been I've done two half hour Comedy Central specials and they've never included me in that. And I'm not nobody. You know, I'm not a big star, but I'm certainly, you know, a respected guy. So I just got like pissed off that they didn't include me. And I ended up writing them an email saying, you know, what's the story? Is it, who decides this? You know, why am I not part of this thing that everyone else is part of? And they blew you off. They said, get out of here. We don't care. Oh, You're nobody. You'll me, never amount to anything. They put me on. Oh. So they put me on a month late and I'm talking to Benson about, you know, voting. And you know, it, it makes no difference. All they're trying to do is bring people to their site. They, there's no legitimacy to the contest because people can vote as many times as you want. But like he told me, he's got like, you know, 30,000 Twitter followers or whatever. And and I've got like five. Oh, wait a minute. And Hold on. Is this an opportunity for us to strut some 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 Twitter juice? Should we should we flex a little muscle? We can get you like Maybe. two dozen. We can get you yeah. two dozen we have like 24 that. 24 Twitter followers immediately, Mark Maron. 24 like, Twitter followers. All right. What do you guys M-A-R-O-N. Okay, M-A-R-O-N. at M-A-R-C-M-A-R-O-N. Right. This is, by the way, did anyone see when, uh, uh, Justin, did you see when Kevin Rose and Alex Albrecht were on Late Night with Jimmy Fallon and they picked a random guy out of the audience and they decided they were going to make him a Twitter god? Right no. there. Did you see that? No, I did not see Literally, that. Like, and I don't know if this is a new media, old media thing, but like literally on the show, they're like, everyone subscribe now. And he got like 30,000 instantly, which is pretty good, but like nothing compared to somebody who is just genuinely famous or genuinely has something to say. And then they just appear on Twitter and then they instantly go to like 200,000 or whatever. So I don't know if, I don't know if we'll be able to quite hit those numbers or whatever, but chat room, do me a favor, guys, just uh, hit up Mark Maron. Hey, by the way, Brian, way to make the bar 30,000 where if we don't get there, it's a failure. Oh, on come on, dude. That's, that's, that's freaking late ago. night with Jimmy Fallon. Come on, dude. That's not the same. I mean, and that's your first know. example. Hey, by the way, about this thing that we just thought of, uh, where maybe we have 200 people watching, uh, there's this other thing that got 30,000. So anyway, well, yeah. just add that one up in your head. Kids. All right. What was they Mark- could also, they could do uh, at WTF pod too. But, but here's my point though. Like, so I brought that up on the podcast and then somebody tweeted that I had a short tweener. Like, cause I said, I got a short <laughs> Twitter dick and someone said, so Someone called it a tweener. And I, was I like, like the oh, tweener that's better. Great. T W E I N E R. Yeah, I yeah, love yeah, that. Yeah. I love that. That's awesome. So, uh, hey, hey, yeah. hey, hold on, wait, Mark, uh, r- real quick about just before we get off the, uh, the the YouTube thing, especially as a stand up comic and as somebody who kind of works at his material on stage, uh, how do you take any steps in trying to keep YouTube clips off or telling guys to, to take it we- down if a joke is maybe half baked or not there or you're going to do it <laughs> or maybe you're just like calling someone a racial slur repeatedly from stage cuz you're angry at him well honestly you know i've been sort of a, a a marginal character you know in the world of comedy you know for a long time in the sense that you know i'm a i'm a pretty re- respected comic and and i've been around a long time but i'm not a huge uh you know i don't fill arenas or anything and and quite honestly you know i've gone on conan o'brien with half 
baked jokes. You right. know, when I do yeah. panel, well, there's a lot of stuff I've done on Conan where it's like, uh, oh my God, that's actually got a punchline now. So I'm not really that um, freaked out about it yet because, you know, I, I figure if people want to put me up there, they can put me up there, but I haven't run into a real problem with it. That thing that got up there, it's not that it's a, a horrible clip, but it, it's just weird where you realize that you really don't have much control over it. At least it looks good. No, Why I know exactly what ring? you're talking about because, uh, like, literally there are clips of live performances from, and you know how it is, you have a whole routine, you have a setup, and then everything has a reason that that builds you to one specific punchline, and that's how it is, like, like for you know, I do I do the old school straitjacket escape, and the best part is not the escaping out of the straitjacket. It's it's the six minutes of build up leading up to it, and then of course, what do people put on YouTube? It's that last two minutes. You're like, wow, that's a goofball flailing around yeah, a but, lot. But, but they, they, I mean, they kind of knew you were going to get out, didn't they? Well, yeah, I mean, I of course, wanna... of course, yeah. I mean, there's yeah, I mean, there's there's never <laughs> it'd, be, there's... it'd be a better YouTube clip if you really couldn't get out. If I'd Brian like... <laughs> fail, <laughs> straitjacket fail. Uh, <laughs> Well, here I'll tell you what I don't know, um, uh, you know how much how much time we got with you, uh, but uh, you mentioned Conan O'Brien. You've done a bunch of uh, appearances, I, I believe, I the most. Right? Right? By the by the way, can I can I say real quick, Mark? Uh, I, I did the the looked at Wikipedia. Was blown away. Forty two late night appearances with Conan O'Brien. Is that true? Is that did I read that number right? Yeah, I think it might be forty four now. Like I did a, I did one or two before, right before he moved to uh, to the Tonight Show. But it looks like he might be moving again. So yeah, but uh, but but oh yeah, I, but which which by the way, we wanted to talk to you about because we thought you'd have some insight. But specifically, it said that that was a record. Like that was the most anyone's ever gone on late night with Conan O'Brien. Is that true? Yeah, it's it's definitely up there. I mean, I think it's the most a comedian's got on. I, I think that at, at one time I was in the running with Al Roker and. Norm Macdonald or somebody, but I was a pretty regular guest like three or four times a year since the beginning. Wow. Wow. Well, uh, okay. Well, so, I mean, what, what were you going to say? I cut you off earlier. Well, I was just going to say that, you know, uh, uh, Pat Oswalt made, made, uh, you know, big waves on, on the comedy death ray podcast, uh, given his, uh, two cents on the whole Leno Conan situation. And it's blown up on Twitter, especially when Conan came out today, said he's not going to be part of moving, uh, the, the tonight show to 1205 as somebody who's, had oh, wait a minute. A, did that come out today? I didn't hear that. It, what, yeah, what did he yeah, say? yeah, yeah, yeah. He no, released Conan a statement. He had a, a statement, not saying that he was going to leave the show, but just saying that he did not want to move. The, 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 the Tonight Show was not the Tonight Show if it was at 12.05. Right, right. Uh, so yeah, my, my question to you, Mark, is well, what's your take? I mean, well, what do you think? And, about and first of all, if, if I may interject real quick, did you, did you hear what Patton Oswalt had to say about it? No. Okay. Well, maybe we'll find a clip. Well, maybe maybe we'll find a clip of it here in a bit. But in the meantime, what what's your take on this whole situation? Is this sort of like the ultimate soap opera for comedians to watch this go down? Well, all I know is that you know I I had a set approved and I, I was supposed to go on. <laughs> so, oh, uh, oh, really? Oh. I didn't I didn't have a date yet, but I, no, I I mean I don't want to make I don't want to be selfish about it. Look, I I mean I I just heard this stuff today. You know, Conan's been very good to me over the years. Uh, I, I think they're, you know, they're selling them a little short. And I think what the, the scariest thing about the, the the whole way the television business works now is that he certainly had a long time to develop who he is. And they didn't really give him a fair shake. And, and Jay Leno, initially, I thought, was really being a bad sport to even take that spot before Conan be, because it was like seeing him there. It was like, dude. You're done. Why, why are you still hanging around just making it difficult for the other guy? But now I'm starting to think like NBC had always planned this, that they'd always like left him there as a placeholder. And they were really had, you know, Conan on a pretty short leash. And I'm just sad because it would have been nice to see it evolve because quite honestly, the Tonight Show set has never looked better. The band looks better. It's cleaner. It's not a circus anymore in the sense where, you know, you got people touching people and it just looks classy. Yeah. And I, and I, you know, I sort of wanted Conan to be able to 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 take a little time to settle into that that space. You know, I'm just sad for the people that, you know, because I know all the people that have worked there. I've worked with them for years and and job insecurity for anybody. And the, the fact that they all got up and moved to, to New York and that they're being they're being cut off at their knees, you know, by a fairly panicky and and uh, and and um, and and not a very you know decent network. I, I I I don't know what else to say about it other than well, especially I, because when Conan's first go around, I mean he was he was you know people were very harsh on him when he first got started and and saying that you know the. It took a while, and I was proud that NBC gave him a chance to develop and become what he is to, today. And I'm surprised that they didn't give him a chance that second time. Well, I think that, like you know, Conan. The, the amazing thing about 
being on the show for as many years as I have, I don't have a relationship with him. Physical you know, relationship? Not buddies. You know, we don't hang out. So our dynamic was. Oh, dude, I really, saw you on TV. You guys are friendly and shaking hands. That means you're like best friends, right? Is that? Oh yeah, right. That's what people think. Like, you know, why am I on so much? It's because I developed a dynamic with him. He could be like, "Oh, here's Crazy Mark." Well, it's what the, you know. What's the, you know? What's the dark <laughs> guy going to say? So, <laughs> what? But you know, he's sort of like, you know, he's very true to himself and his personality. He's a very high strung guy that needs to, you know, get like when he saves a joke. Like there are guys. If you watch John Stewart or you watch uh, David Letterman, I never really watched Leno. I don't. I never really locked in. It, it always seemed very middle of the road to me, and I, I just, I, I, he always seemed to, I, I don't know. I just, I never, I never really tried to get on that show. I was but, very. By the excited. way, real, real quick, I don't want to actually play Pat Oswalt's clip because uh, this is your show, and we're much more excited to have you than to play a clip of someone else. Uh, although we'll be happy to have you on the show, Pat Oswalt. But uh, essentially, the gist of what he said on Comedy Death Ray was that it was very disheartening because when you saw. Uh, David Letterman, it was obvious that um, uh, that David Letterman grew up watching The Tonight Show and loved it so much that he felt like he had something to bring to it to make something happen. When you saw Conan O'Brien, it was obvious that he loved the show so much, that, that he watched David Letterman so much, and he loved what David Letterman was doing and felt like he could bring something to it. And when you watch Jay Leno, it's obvious that Jay Leno wanted the prize. He wanted to sit on the throne. That was that was the, the bulk of what he said. And I don't know if that's true, but that seems consistent with what a lot of other comedians have indicated about Jay Leno. I don't know. You know, I, I, I don't know if I agree with that. I mean, you know, the bottom line is, is that, you know, as a comic in television, there are just there are certain jobs that comics do in television. Uh, either they're going to be on a sitcom built around them or as a bit player or they're going to host something. I mean, that's what comics do on television. What right. else do they do? That that's the only two jobs available. You know, and I think whatever the fight was between Letterman and Leno, that, it, you know, a hosting job is a job a comic does. They do it on award shows. They do it on, you know, on talk shows. There's only a couple of jobs for comics in television. That's just the, the reality. Right. Most of them aren't actors or they're not that great. So, I mean, that's fine. He can look at it like that. I, I just never liked Leno. Uh, and and my, my thing about Conan, uh, what I was saying is that as he evolved over time, was that he was very uncomfortable at the beginning and and he is that guy you know he he's you know he's high strung and you know he he can get a lot out in a very short time and the point i was trying to make was that people like john stewart or like david letterman they're they're very quick and they, and they have very impeccable sort of pauses and timing in the way that they can you know save a segment or get a laugh whereas conan over time really developed this amazing ability to like in, in about 15 seconds in order to save a dead spot, he'll take you on a roller coaster ride that you never thought you were going. Right. Like, you know, like it's like, la, 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 la. And like he, I guess what I'm saying is that he developed a style that I, I had never seen before. Right. Uh, as, as a hosting personality and he owned it and he owned his weird quirkiness and, and, and he earned it. I mean, he was pretty green when he started and everyone was hard on him because they didn't think he deserved it. He wasn't a comic. He didn't have chops. And even now when he does a monologue, sometimes you don't know which way it's going to go. But as a comedic performer, he's really developed his own thing. And he should have been given or afforded the opportunity to, to build on it and make it work in that time slot. And, and I find it, you know, reprehensible of NBC to do this, to protect a bottom line that is diminishing anyways. Right. And to think. So, well, I mean, if, if I can ahead. ask real quick, if you're going to handicap this, all right, how is this? How is this play out? If you've got, no, forget uh, that. No, no, no. Ironclad sixty-four thousand dollar prediction in a sealed lock box. What happens, Mark? Prognosticate. Well, I, I, you know, look, you guys. I don't know if you've done radio, but if this were radio and these guys were talking the way they were talking and releasing statements like they were releasing, you know, I, you know, you know, Conan would be off. He, he'd be done now. What uh, just you know, for not just for not towing the line just for just for talking the way he's talking? Well, well what are they going to do now? All this stuff is public, so now are they going to make this a public debate every night on the two shows? I mean, where, where does this go now? I mean, well, you know, with you know, with NBC, I mean that's that's what I'm with. You know, David Letterman. All of a sudden, everything breaks that he's that he's banging the the intern, or he comes out and talks about it on the show, and that was the first time that he blew ahead of the Tonight Show, and he's kept that lead ever since. If all of a sudden. You know, uh, because everybody's tuning into the the Leno ten o'clock show and the Tonight Show with Conan O'Brien because they're going to be taking shots back and forth at each other. I mean, at, at this point, NBC, you know, they're going to have to shell out money 
no matter what, to move things around and actually make a decision, which they haven't made over the last 10 years. By the way, if I could, I'm going to out jury right now. Justin actually is pro Conan going over to Fox. And at first I was just like, you know, people who had a chance at the Tonight Show and moved to Fox don't have a strong track record. As far as I know, Fox never had a consistent, you know, success story with late night talk. But he did point out that uh, the, the last time that somebody was supposed to be crowned the the Lord of the Tonight Show and went to another network, it worked out pretty well for David Letterman. So I don't know if it... I, I think, I mean, obviously, I think what's going to happen is that they're going to return Jay to 1130. I think Conan's playing hardball now. And I, I, I hope he ends up with his own show somewhere. I mean, he's going to get paid a lot of money. And I feel bad for the people that are on his staff. Uh, I, I'd be fine if he, he showed up at Fox, but I, I'd be happy if he you know, told NBC to screw themselves. By the way, I have to apologize to the actual chat. This is a, this is a bit of a departure from our normal format. We're just so like, this is something that we're just so personally into this drama and to get somebody who actually, you know, knows all the oh, people involved. God, God forbid, God forbid, the biggest uh, Twitter trending topic today that everybody's talking about. It's a universally recognized hot button issue that uh, is commanding the interest of how many million people. God forbid we talk about. Hey, you hear that, show. fans? Sweet you Lord. hear that chat room? You hear that, people oh, who love the show? Oh, well, here, you, know, you know what's interesting is that what I've been feeling on, in a gut level and what I was feeling when Conan took the gig and also, you know, the way, you know, Jay was so lackadaisical in terms of structuring a show or even seeming to give a damn about what he was doing at 10 o'clock is that no one's given any security, not even in, you know, in, 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 a, in a job that requires a little time, is that I felt such a sense of desperation. And I feel that on most television right now is you get people, whether they're talking about politics or they're talking about entertainment, there is such a pace. There's such a desperation. Like I had to take a meeting at E! Entertainment Television. I don't even know what's on E! All right. And, and I, I got to be honest, man. Pretty sure I've it involves Paris Hilton, I watched, whatever it is. I, well, I watched E. I tried to sit down and watch it for two hours, and it felt like my brain was being raped by clowns. <laughs> I mean, I couldn't believe it. And, it, and you it, know it's what? just like this pace and this desperation With the that fake nobody sense takes. of Jasmine. Your new goal in life needs to be so that you become so successful, like they're proud of that quote that you just said of E. <laughs> <laughs> It's so that's why I like doing the podcast is that like, you know, you can actually have a conversation. You can get to know people. I just I felt bad that Conan, you know, like he had to take that gig and, you know, you got this microscope on you and he is only what he is. And I just wanted him to relax. And how the hell is a guy going to relax when, you know, every day they're, they're watching their numbers change and they know that even there, even though it's a hundred million dollar show that they can still get the axe. It's just a shame that you know, these expectations are placed on on entertainers and, you know, we're, we're denied this this possibility of them turning into something great because they're like, please, please, please don't don't change the channel. Please, please. Right. Well, oh, I, yeah. Well, I mean, I'll tell you, it's a perfect storm also for Conan because, number one, there was always the question of whether or not he could play at 1130. NBC decides to take this disastrous experiment of putting something at 10 o'clock that's not a drama that carries no weight. Their prime time's already an absolute mess. And in the middle of it, David Letterman has this gigantic uh, publicity. I mean, he had the, the Sarah Palin thing that uh, really jacked his publicity and the sleeping with interns thing. And, you know, on, on top of it, NBC gets sold but, to Comcast but, but, where but they also, want Jay Leno win to begin with. But, but the thing that we can't forget really is that out of all of them, out of all of them, David Letterman is the only class act broadcaster. You know, David Letterman, you know, um, you know the, the reason he got the bump, you know, whether it was the, the honesty uh, of, of how he handled the philandering situation or not, is that the bottom line is, is that as he gets older, he gets more honest and, you know, and he gets more confident and his craft is so in place and he runs such a class act over there. And he is truly at one with a television camera. He, the reason he's such a pleasure to watch is he is a, a, an old school broadcaster. There's only a couple of them around. Regis Philbin is the only other one that's on TV that can actually hold a camera for 20 minutes. Yeah, he, huh? I saw Regis Philbin as a as a magician on Fantasy Island. So long, long pedigree of magicians who become somebody. That's my but, whole but the, thing. But the thing <laughs> is, is, like you know, David Letterman had class to begin with. Jay Leno never had a lot of class, and he, he ran a, a fairly messy kind of you know frenetic, desperate show. But I think the real reason Letterman 
transcended was because he earned it and he deserved it. And people started to realize like, you know, this guy is, you know, he's the real deal and he's, he's, uh, and he's, he's pretty genuine. All right. So let me ask you this. And, and I want to get back to the podcast now, because this is a big, this is a trend that we're seeing a lot of people who are in old media and for whatever reason, it's not working for them. Now, some people are forced into a position where they got to decide what to do next. For example, Adam Carolla is having an incredibly popular podcast now after his situation. Uh, it's an emerging landscape. And what's really exciting to me is that this is the 1950s of broadcast television. This is the 1970s of cable television where nobody knows what they're doing. The audience is essentially zero. The money is essentially zero. All we see is it's, it's you read stories about the, the Oklahoma land rush where all of a sudden, like literally they were giving land away for free and nobody knew it was good for at the time. And people went out there just on the idea that there was something to it. And they grabbed, they staked their claim early on. And those are the people who prospered. And it seems like that's what's happening now. I'm really interested in what it takes to decide to to make that jump and what the difference is. What's the biggest difference you've noticed with doing the pie? And you talked about being able to do whatever you want. But outside of that, like, what's the biggest difference you've noticed now that you're doing a podcast over an old school media show? Well, the difference was something I noticed in radio, too, is that, as I said before, that the, the relationship you develop with the people that listen is is very real, is very intimate, and 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 they can become very loyal. You know, if you don't, uh, you know, ruin that relationship. And I I choose to be uncomfortably honest on my podcast about myself and about my mind and about you know where I am in my career. You used to be, but my- but you don't anymore. Is that a conscious decision? What. You said you used to be. No, no, no. He says he is. He oh, he is. is. Oh, you are. Oh, good. No, I misheard you. I misheard you because that's actually what I was going to ask is it seems to me personally the biggest difference I've noticed is that a complete breakdown of the fourth wall where it's like every self-doubt, every insecurity that you have, every behind the scenes, you know, we talk openly about the lingo that we use and we explain the entire business model of what we're doing while we're doing it live. Uh, I mean, and, and it seems like there's some of that in your show as well. I don't know what the business model is. I'm sort of flying by the seat of my pants. And I don't, you know, I had to learn how to, you know, I had some other podcasters help me in setting up a studio, you know, cause usually, you know, when you do old media, you know, you have a company that does that. So, you know, for me, like I, I, you know, I know that I've been, I've spent 25 years of my life putting a craft in place. You know, a lot of it is stand up, some of it is radio, you know, and, and I, I know that, that my my particular expression has to be very honest and very real. And what I'm finding, not unlike when I did political radio, you know, in 2004, where where we would do lefty political radio, and I was getting emails from people in the South saying, "Thank God you're there. I'm in my basement." Or they call the show and like, "I can't go upstairs because I'm I live in a red state and no one can know that I listen to you guys." But you know, I thought I was losing my mind, and because you're out there, I feel a little more sane. Is that I don't do politics anymore in in any partisan way. So what I'm finding now is this: by sharing my feelings about what's going on in my mind in relation to culture at large is that I'm getting the same type of interaction from my audience. Like, dude, I thought it was crazy. Thank God you're there. And did, if I can provide that service for people, that's great entertainment. Do, do you feel, did you feel a pressure when you were on Air America to make everything an us versus them type of thing? No, I, I don't, you know, I don't know enough about it in, in, in the sense that it wasn't a pressure. You know, you just, you know, you, you go with your gut. I'm not a political, I'm not a wonky guy. I don't, you know, I don't know all the players. Some guys are like, they like, they look at politics like sports, you know, it's this game where, you know, they might as well have Senator playing cards and dude. And they really do. It's like sports for those guys. And my dad's one of those guys on the other side, he's, you know, Rush Limbaugh running 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And, uh, uh, for them, it's, it's a rooting for our team and their team. And I can't, I can't understand. I get too upset one way or the other. So I just decided. Well, I do, I did oh, a bit of, I'm, like, the, I'm like one of those guys. I mean, I'm not rooting for a team, but I definitely enjoy the mechanism. For you, it's wrestling. You know. For you, it's just like, Oh is- no, he did it. Oh, what you gotta do? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, how else are you going to understand what the, what, what the process is? I mean, ultimately when you boil it down, uh, you know, a campaign is getting more, uh, people, more impressionable people to press your button in a booth. Right. That's it. That's the name That's of right. the game. And then Say what, whatever, what take that there, out. What you what lose that? there is like what what really represents the people. And what's sad about the whole process is that most people don't know much of anything. They just repeat what they've oh. heard from people that are trying to you know put posit an agenda in their head. My my sense of politics was like you know what do you think is right and wrong, and both parties 
you know, work the minds of people. And both parties are guilty of, of misrepresenting the people. And they're all whores. And the you know the, the government is owned and occupied by corporations and yeah you, you know it's funny as you said uh, I don't know if you said they're whores or they're horrors but I realized either of those would work just fine for the point that you were making so what I was trying to do is put some heart into the idea of of, of what is righteous and what you know what really represents people and all all it comes down to now is who's going to win and and we're in a, we live in a time where you know people are in a lot of trouble and no one's providing any real solutions and they don't care uh you know i i don't really want to get into the politics of it but you know most of what i was doing in political radio was just talking about my own mind my own heart and trying to generate some powerful political satire and comedy which we did on on morning sedition that that show because i had like a bunch of comedians and comedy writers hanging around. We did some great radio. Theater. You could actually do and like written bits, which is which actually leads into the next thing I wanted to ask you because the the one thing that I honestly don't think I'd ever heard before on the WTF podcast was was I was it last episode or the one before that when you had the guy from from SAT from Safe Abuse Technologies come yeah. in and go on. Yeah. Uh, if it was a magic trick. You totally fooled me. Like eight minutes in, when this guy—I mean, can I tip? Can I tip where it heads? Because I really want to pick your brain on this. Yeah, guest is a guest. You know, it's out there. I mean, okay. So the guy, and and I'm going to tell it the way I remember it. And I don't know if this is the way that it was intended to come across, but it is the way I tried to explain it to, to Justin. Is yeah, you, you have a guest on, and and you start off by admitting that you didn't have time to, you know, a booker just got this guy in, this guy from Safe Abuse Technologies that wants to like the crux of his thrust is that, look, kids are going to want to explore drugs and ways to alter their consciousness. And so, um, you know, you, uh, 60% of people uh, at the at adolescence try illegal substances or alter their consciousness some way or other. And the point is, is they want to demystify, desexify the, uh, the, the altered conscious drug experience. And this guy claims that he was going to have families uh, actually get high together. Now, here's the thing, like eight minutes into it, this guy's talking about how um, uh, the adolescent brain is controlled by the uh, amygdala. I don't know if I'm saying that right. The amygdala, which which is does not respond to fear and talks about how when you play, you know, marijuana ads that that, that play on, you know, oh, you're going to kill your little sister if you do the drugs. That doesn't that doesn't register and that you got to hit them on another level. And then like like the guy's got so much seriousness, so much facts behind him. And I'm totally buying everything. And then, and then the guy, just tell me, was that a bit? Because I don't think I've ever heard a bit set up for eight, ten minutes straight before there was any kind of payoff. Was that a bit? No, he, he was a guest. And you know, he, you know, in terms of what we do on the show, I mean, are you going to tell me how you do your magic tricks? I mean, there, there's a, <laughs> a an element to WTF that we are are working with, which is really to create. A, a genuine WTF experience. So I don't really. It was okay. No, and 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 let me tell you, it was without a doubt one of the greatest WTF experiences in all of audio listening I've ever experienced. And and in fact, now I'm not going to say the bit because you need to listen to the. Do you remember which episode number it was? So I could tell everyone. Yeah, it was the last. It was. Uh, it was the. I think it's. It's not the it's most on, recent one, but the one before it. It's the one with um, the guy's name's Daryl Loomis. Daryl you know, Loomis. We, we were introduced to him. You know, like I, I worked with a couple of people that refer to me. You know, sort of. You know, uh, off the grid guests, and um, and I don't really know where it's going to go. And it's my choice. You know, whether or not to air it or not. But I've aired a few of them, and and you know, that's his name. He's on the same episode. As Harold Kramer, I think. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think it's the last episode. Her Harold Kramer, is, is that the one that does the rap songs? Yeah. Yeah, oh, very funny. Right. Very funny, all that yeah. stuff. But, but uh, okay, well, good. Well, then, I'm not going to say anything. I am just, just going to say, every, and maybe we'll listen to it in the after show. We, all, we, also, we also have a big premiere. We're going to premiere uh, in the after show, right, Justin? You got a project that you're putting out it's there? A, it's episode uh, 36. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're launching episode 36. Sorry, Mark, it. go ahead. No, no, no. Episode it's 36. episode thirty-six was what he was saying, but uh, yeah. So you've you've there, got something. And by the way, for people who are just uh, just tuning in, uh, of course, the WTF podcast is Mark Marin's new podcast. Uh, just started a, a few months ago, but go ahead and and please subscribe to it immediately, as many, many, many people have already done on the iTunes Store. By the way, do you remember, Mark, what your Twitter following was just thirty short minutes ago? Yeah, it was about. 
5,100 or 200. And I think now, let's see. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but NSFW. Five, it's like 5,500. That's like man. almost 500, dude. So yeah, there's that. Was that. Good. that was good. That's I, uh, I, Now I'm going to have to deliver the goods to those 300 new people. It's my <laughs> extra case. <laughs> just, use, just use wiener jokes. Just refer to your tweener yeah. repeatedly, and you'll be just fine. My, sir. my tweener got a little bigger. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> half inch by half inch. We're, uh, we're adding that self-confidence. I don't know if we have time to totally open the can of worms, but one of the things that you had said on the show that apparently upset your fans was that you weren't going to go see Avatar. Did you ever go see Avatar? I did, and I'll be able to uh, talk about it on Thursday's show. Oh, you I, can't tip anything now? What? Uh, I mean, about your opinion on it, or you're going to talk about Okay, I'll wait for the show. Okay, here's my opinion on it. Okay, good, good. Yeah. All right, go, go. Is anything, is anything worth $100 million an hour? No. Nothing. And the truth of the matter is, is that as beautiful as it was, as spectacular as the glasses were, within 15 minutes of leaving that theater, I had nothing in my head about it. I had no memories about it. I didn't give a shit about it. And I still think it was a colossal waste of money and a tremendous dangling set of keys that made somebody about a billion dollars. And it just indicates to me how truly stupid and desperate we are as a culture. It's not about the apocalypse. Avatar is the apocalypse. Uh, wow, that was much more than I'd hoped to get from you. <laughs> <laughs> that was right up mm, honesty. You unzipped and slipped and woo, there it is. That was I feel amazing. I ashamed that I went to see it. That was amazing, though. We are, I mean, come on. See, I like, come, like, yeah, there, was, there was no room in this culture then, Mark, for, for diversion or just like, hey, there's some crazy blue people up on screen. There's no for room half a, for that. For half, a, for half a billion dollars in the middle of a recession, is there room for that? Sure, you can be all excited about it, but just realize that that's what your culture represents. Yeah, it's great. It's great. I'm proud. <laughs> it's man, you're like, be proud. I mean, that's it's who you are, sir. Like, that's who yes, you we, are. We are an extravagant, opulent culture that, you know, uh, that dies on ridiculous days, entertainment like friend. this. All right, hold on, hold on. But real real quick, we don't normally do this, but we got a caller coming in, one of our longtime contributors, O-Docta, Owen J.J. Stone, a.k.a. O-Docta. Uh, I'm guessing you have something to say about this. What do you say, O-Docta? First thing, this is the worst show NSFW has ever done. Secondly, this is the best guest you've ever had, just for the fact that he agrees with me 100% on Avatar. Oh, worst show and best that guest. Again. That's you know, not usually how it again, goes. But, you know, I agree wholeheartedly with you, sir, and kudos to you for a, a dramatic and emphatic answer to the man. All in right. love with blue people. Okay, all right, get out of here, old doctor. I knew I shouldn't have taken your call because you disagree with me. See, to me, I come from the other angle. I'm like, I don't care if it's how much it costs to make. To me, is it worth seven bucks? And I, you know, I was seven bucks. I thought it was all right, but I'm not going to challenge bucks. you on it. Seven bucks? Where did you see it? Uh, actually, I saw it at the Alamo Draft House. So it was probably more than that because it tends to be more expensive. In, My uh, feeling is, is that if they're going to spend that kind of money in the day and age we live in now, if I'm going to pay $18 for an admission ticket to a $300 million movie, I should get health care coverage with the admission. <laughs> well, no, I'll tell you what, if James Cameron wanted to do that, considering his track record, uh, you know, I'll tell you what, I, I wouldn't. Uh, it would be health care in 3 say, uh, say It's a bad idea. That's <laughs> Look, right. I, you know, I understand it. You know, I've gotten emails you know, defending this movie in that, like, it created jobs. Really did it? How many? How many jobs did it really create? I just feel that, it, you know, in terms of, of elevate, and then there's a the whole argument. It's like, it's about environmentalism. It's about, you know, uh, it's an anti-war statement. It's like, yeah, if a parent sits down and translates to a kid the analogy that's in place. I mean, it's really just a, 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 a spectacular waste of money to to create a new technology that will become an industry standard in order to move distraction to a higher level and the fact that 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 people are actually you know i, I read an article that some people are experiencing post avatar uh, depression that they want to live horse. in the movie that's horseshit. <laughs> no they're just depressed that they didn't actually get to bone any of the blue people that's what they're depressed about the blue cat I, people they can't get in them that's what they're all they're all feisty about. By the way, I mean, I, I, I think I think it is a very it's a beautiful anti-war statement. You know, you don't you believe that for a seat, second. If what you're being you all right, sure, Brian. Really all right, step on the joke. No, no oh, I'm sorry. Right. I'm sorry. No, you go ahead. Go ahead and I'm start sorry. Scream in was... the middle of uh, the windup. 
No, go ahead. No, no, I'm sorry. I just, I was so shocked to hear you say that. I'm sorry, go ahead. You were saying it's a beautiful oh, wine, whatever, that there's whatever. no saving Moments it. Fast. I totally screwed Moments that up. Fast. Look, I think, I think that, you know, I agree and I, I understand that, you know, you're experiencing a lot of national pride and that we should all be very excited that this movie made over a billion dollars internationally and that people are such tremendous suckers and want to have an isolated entertainment option. They want to pay for three hours of distraction. Like for that kind of money, you know, for th or for three hundred billion dollars, they should be able to afford something that'll make me feel good for a year, three hours, a I year. Mean, maybe you just you just expect too much out of a trip to the movies. Then, no, I expect a lot out of a half a billion dollars. All right, well, real quick. But if we if we can spend it, we can spend it. I mean, listen. I mean, it's just it's just the way it goes. I mean, extravagant movie budgets, considering what they got out of that money, we've spent way more money, way more wantonly in movies alone in the last year. It was, it, was a for, it was a forgettable movie with a crappy script that bordered on on racist and imperialistic ridiculousness. It, it was like it it had nothing other than the fact that we could wear glasses and the blue people like they were kind of, you know, the, the blue women were kind of hot, kind of yeah. sexually charged. Apparently Obviously, like Gordy Weaver's looked in years. That, yeah. <laughs> that's right. The digital Sigourney Weaver was was awesome. Apparently. Now, I don't know if this is true, but Justin told me that apparently uh, James Cameron would go up and down the cubicle saying, seriously, would you bone this? <laughs> like, like he wanted them to be hot, hot. Yeah, up and down that. the cubicles with all those people that were manufacturing women that they could actually have sex with. That's it's the tremendous. only women. All right, Here look, we we've go. got two issues we need to settle because we're coming up on an hour and we try. Why is this the worst show that this guy's ever seen? What do you guys do usually? I took that very personal. All right, well, I'll tell you. You know why? Because we actually wanted, uh, we're, to be honest, you know how it's like, you know, the, uh, the boss comes over, somebody you're very excited to see, and you sort of do your best to put on your best for them. Uh, the chat room remembers the episode where we had somebody attempt to break a world record for sucking down the most Gatorade and threw up. They remember an episode when we when we uh, listened to people's childhood trauma and laughed at it. I mean, it's, I, I don't know. What, you describe it to him, Justin. I'm too ashamed All of right, our here's, audience. Here's the problem, uh, Mark. Uh, we have a very, you know, uh, I guess frenetic would be a kind way to say it. Retarded would be the mean way to say it kind of show normally. And we usually have these kind of, uh, you know, uh, bits and everything. And we're... We're really not. We uh, make everything super a big, secure. stupid it's game, and we refuse to actually engage the audience and talk about anything that matters to either of us. We're having any kind of rational, intelligent discourse. And apparently, our deep, dark secret is that we're deeply ashamed of the idiotic show that we do. And finally, for once, we get somebody with a brain in their skull on the show, and we have the opportunity to strut our stuff and actually manufacture a conversation, the likes of which will be talked about for years to come. And all the chat room has to say, all the chat room has to say, is where is the puke? Where is the puke? And it breaks my heart just a little bit that they can't hang on to listen to somebody like Mark Maron. Is that what you were trying to say, Justin? I'm sorry. No, uh, no, something like that. And also Avatar Blue. <laughs> <laughs> Way to way to roll right over. I, I I wish I would have I would have thrown up or something. <laughs> this is uh, by the way. All of a sudden, now the people who are quietly lurking in the chat room are actually saying that they've enjoyed this better than other episodes. That's the problem. Is we are not uh, we haven't clearly defined that we're one thing every week, week after week. Every week we try to be a little bit different. The first episode we made up a whole. The first episode was essentially a game show. The second episode was like a was was a guessing game of personal confession. The third episode, you know, we had. Uh, my friends who do a movie review site and we did nothing but talk about movies that whole time and argue really a lot. A drinking game on YouTube videos. We like, did a you boost thing. Uh, the, the thing is, if you don't, if, if you're like, oh, this isn't like other NSFW shows. The point about NSFW is that we define the parameters each and every episode. We want to talk a little bit long different. form with somebody who knew what the fuck he was talking about, people. That's right. I'm sorry if we can cater to your whims every week. Love me, internet. Love me. <laughs> and that's the heart of NSFW right there. Real quick, we got two things that we got to do. One thing is we got to address the question we had before the show began was who would look more like this picture of Mark Marin, the actual Mark Marin, or Justin Robert Young. All right, and so and so you got to do you got to do the face. So so hold on, we got it. We got it. And it's got it. You got to look like you're about to ask what. Like it's you're clearly forming a W. Hold on, let me. I'm gonna get rid of the bug for this. You're clearly forming a W. <laughs> I can't decide. 
I can't decide. I'm going to call it a tie. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> We're just gonna leave it there like that for now on. All right. I got. I blinked. I blinked. Mark wins. All right. Mark wins. Second of all, second thing we got to clear up is, uh, look, you know about radio and media and that kind of thing. Um, oh, that's a great. Uh, the chat room, by the way, wants you to do a rapid fire, and and I'll explain what that is in a moment. I think that's a pretty good idea. But but we here's the problem, real quick, Mark, and I'd like your advice on this because we only got like five more minutes. So we're gonna wrap everything up. What, well, Justin, you want to explain what happened? I don't know what you're going to talk about. I, I'm going to talk about what happens when you throw a, a, a throw down and nobody shows up. Oh, okay. Right. So here's the thing. Real quick, guys. Uh, and if, if you are just listening to the podcast, this is the first time you're going to hear about it. Uh, two weeks ago, or yeah, it was the, our last episode, two weeks ago. Our, our most time, recent episode, um, we said, we said, do me a favor and Twitter out that that NSFW is the best show sponsored by Ford. Sink My Ride podcast, right? Yes, right. that's what we did. And then. Oh, now I can talk? Yes. Okay. Because I have the uh, cameras that I can switch. So, over. yeah, that's no, fine. Listen. Uh, so here's what we did. Yeah, we, we wrote out uh, that this, uh, we were, NSMW was the best uh, episode or the best show sponsored by Sing My Right podcast. And uh, Twiff, This Week in Fun, the other show on the uh, the Twit Network, it's kind of a comedy in in genre. Martin Sargent decided to uh, take offense to that, personal offense, and said that our claim was horse apples. Or only or he used a dirty word, which we don't people. approve of on yeah, a show know, called Not Safe for yeah, Work. We can use. So anyway, um, uh, we, we were, were on another show that wasn't NSFW last week, and we decided to kind of go uh, up the ante. We talked a little smack, hoping that there'd be a little bit of a back and forth. Unfortunately, Brian, that hasn't happened, has it? Well, no. And and look, you guys are smart enough at home to know that no, uh, very unlikely that two shows under the same network truly hate each other. And the fact is, is we have tremendous respect for both Martin Sargent and for Sarah Lane. But the fact is, is they said bring it on. And so we brought it. We had some awesomely hilarious uh, photoshops that we put together. And I'm trying to actually find them live while we do it on the air, which isn't working out so well. But uh, the point is, is since then, nary a peep. They say bring it on. And then we bring on the pain. And then they just sit And there. then even last Tuesday when we were on the air, Sarah Lane goes in and tweets out, oh, magic man, uh, you know, you, you're going to, you just opened up a world of pain. And then nothing, literally nothing. We, yeah. we hear nothing from that, nothing from Martin, nothing from Sarah on Twitter. There's just, there's literally no reaction. We made the front page a dig with our Photoshop. Yes. Um, you know, and there's there's nothing from these people. So I don't know what to do. Which okay? leads me to which leads me to wonder if all of this wasn't like some kind of, like that was their big shtick. They're like, hey, I got this idea. We'll call them out. We'll tell them to bring it on. And then when they bring it on, we'll just be like, well, you gentlemen are rude. And then that's, and then they'll look like idiots and we'll win. Exactly, which is if that is their their goal, then congratulations. By the congratulations, way, congratulations, folks. You've you've hoodwinked us like hey, Avatar on. has hoodwinked a door. willing nation. All right, somebody's at your yeah. door. Right, meanwhile, real quick, we'll show the folks at home some of the twitters. Like we said, we said, put your photoshops together that uh, that depict NSFW defeating. Uh, uh, this week in fun, and this was my favorite, and I'm actually going to recapture here, but it's you, you see Bob Ross painting NSFW, and you see in the background with an X in it, this week in fun, like he's just done with it. I thought they were, and then one person took our famous uh, Frodo Baggins picture and completed it to actually show that it's Sarah Lane with the Frodo Baggins, and I thought that was pretty seamless as well. That's great. Now listen, this is all fantastic work, and of course, playing off the uh, this week in... Meme, uh, they have that uh, <laughs> that cover there. But the point is, here's all we wanted to say about this is, look, this is to you this week in fun. Either bring it or we're going to go back to having tea every Thursday. If you want to have polite discourse, we can go back to doing that and we can be best buddies at the bar. Or if you want to freaking have a feud, you got to come up with some genius like this with awesome, sexy Justin Robert Young, Megan Fox being offered a rose by I Sarah would, Lane. That's I what would. you need to do. I would touch my own boobs so yeah, much. I believe you would, dude. I rather like this one here where you jump out and say, Toasty! Toasty! All right. So uh, I think that's about it. Oh, there is one request from the chat room. Chat room wants to know, we do something, Mark, we call rapid fire, where we end each episode. Sometimes it's a round table. Sometimes it's just one of us straight up. We look at the flow of incoming texts from the chat room, and they offer a bunch of either-or questions. 
and just boom, flat out, you say X or Y. Why? Because of blank. And straight on, straight on, straight on, all the way through. Would you be interested uh, with, with giving us a quick rapid fire? We call it rapid fire. What do I do now? All you do is you watch this flow of questions coming from the chat room. You pick out yeah. ones you like. They'll all be either or. You just got to give an honest either or right off the bat. And then, uh, and then go on to the next one. You you do have to read it, of course, because otherwise the audio listeners don't know what you're talking about. So so if all of a sudden you see up there red or blue, you say red or blue, red. Right. And then okay, if you have okay, a reason, okay, you say okay. a reason. If you don't, just move on to the next one. Right. Okay. okay. Fair enough. You down for that? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Here we go. And rapid fire begins in three, two, one, go. Leno or, Leno or Conan, I'll go with Leno. Megan Fox or Avatar Chicks? Uh, Megan Fox. Uh, plastic or paper? Paper. Uh, Rachel or Stephanie? I don't know them. Uh, <laughs> hookers or blow? Blow. Uh, pot or Coke? Uh, both. Balls or balls? That's a big question. <laughs> that's a, that's a, he's, like, he's like, I'm on to your trick, sir. Oral or anal? I'll, I'll definitely go with oral. Uh, classical or Keynesian? Oh, shut up. Uh, <laughs> Justin or Brian? I, okay. It's Justin. It's Justin. Uh, Nazis or Scientologists? I'll have to go with Nazis. They're more honest. Um, <laughs> masturbation or auto fellatio? I can only do one of those with any success. So, um, hobo or bag? Badge, <laughs> uh, tweener, or oh my god! Now I can't read them. They're coming by so fast. That's when people get into it. You call espresso it espresso or want. espresso. I'm going to stick with espresso. You can go screw yourself. Uh, <laughs> Jews or blacks? Being a Jew, I'll have to go with blacks. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 Avatar or Peta? Uh, I'm going to go with Peta on that one. Richard or Dick? Dick, of course. Um. Communists or Nazis? I'm going to go with Nazis again, more honest. Dennis Leary or Mark Maron? Oh, yeah, I'll have to go with Mark Maron on that. <laughs> <laughs> Mel Gibson, I lost that one. Mel Gibson or Hitler? <laughs> uh, I'm going to go with Hitler. Um, <laughs> smoke or no smoke? No more smoke. Mormon or Baptist? Got to love the Mormons for being so All right, crazy. two more. Two more. Jesus or Allah? I'm going to go over their head and stick with Yahweh. Oh. Uh, All right, you got one more. Mushrooms. Got to go with mushrooms. Dude, and there we go. Let me tell you, dude, I've never heard anyone not pick mushrooms in a face-off like that. It's like I wouldn't know, but but everyone who talks that way says good things. Uh, hey. <laughs> Hey, does what, that mean I win? What? Yes, it, it does. does. I was gonna, I was gonna tease thirty seconds of your video we're gonna show after the show, Justin. What? what yeah, am, absolutely. Hey, listen, folks. Uh, me and Andrew Main. I need a link. Uh, I need a link though. Uh, what? What should I be searching I for? I sent it to you in the Ustream chat. Oh, fantastic! I'll have to go back to Ustream, log in, yeah. and find it. Uh, uh, oh, wait. No, I can't do that. Go ahead. Keep going. Look, yeah, okay. this is good. Everything's uh, so smooth. Anyway, uh, me and Andrew Main, who, along with Brian Brush, would do the uh, weirdthings.com podcast. And uh, Andrew Main publishes weirdthings.com and iTrix. Me and him have a new project. It is called Sunnyland Vice. I am very, very, very excited for people's reaction to it. If you are listening to this podcast, uh, then uh, please subscribe to my Twitter, Justin R. Young on Twitter, and uh, you will get the link from there. Otherwise, uh, stay tuned at the end of this podcast. We are going to play the whole thing in its entirety, and hopefully, uh, I have stalled enough for Brian to have yep. queued no, up. No, I got it. I got it. Yeah. Seconds. In in the meantime, we're just going to watch the first like thirty seconds of it all because I tell you, in the modern day with with viral videos, you have to be funny literally in the first five seconds, and that's something I was very proud of you guys for making sure that you did right here. Ah! All right, there we go. Cut it. All right, oh, that's all we get. Okay, so by 30 seconds, that's 20 seconds. That's all right. That's all right. You, get, you get the rest of it. We'll watch the rest of it in the after show. Meanwhile, Mark Marin cannot thank you enough. Where can everyone see you, sir? Where can they see me? I'll be on the John Oliver uh, stand up series on January 29th on Comedy Central. Uh, and you can go to WTFpod.com and, and get uh, hooked up with the podcast twice a week. Uh, on Thursday, we got Matt Bronger. And I went to see Avatar with Kyle Kinane. So we're going to talk about it. And upcoming guests, uh, we've got we got John Caparulo. we got Chelsea Peretti, Bill Burr we did on Monday. That's all available. 
Patton Oswald is there, David Cross, Jim Gaffigan, Jeff Ross, uh, John Oliver. Uh, they're all up there. There's 36 episodes. By the there. way, you know, we're here known for our cutting edge, you know, spoiler alert. He didn't like Avatar. Unless this was all an act. You know, that would be awesome if you went on the show and you're like, listen, I think uh, Avatar was one of the most magical. It wasn't, it wasn't that I didn't like it. It just wasn't worth the money and it did not provide any solutions or any joy or anything even memorable outside of an hour being away no, from the No, uh, stop it, Mark. Listen, it provided a very important lesson to besiege cultures by imperialist nations everywhere, which is find a dragon, a really big dragon that you're otherwise <laughs> yeah, look, scared hey, dude, of. The, you can turn the, top, the tide. The, the, the Top Gun stuff with the dragons, excellent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're, the blue people are going up. He's like, I'm getting a boner. The way like top, all that Top Gun gun lingo. Yeah. All right. Justin Robert Young, uh, itrix.com, weirdthings.com, and the Weird Things podcast. podcast. Anything else you want to plug before we wrap things up, sir? Uh, Justin R. Young on Twitter, and make sure that you look for Sunnyland Vice Sunnyland on YouTube. Vice, which you'll see in the after show. By the way, if you're listening to the audio, if you're watching it recorded, make sure that you join us live. Then you can actually see what everybody's talking about because the chat room has a good time when we're doing it live. But uh, by the way, make sure to check out Scam School at scamschool.tv. Until then, I'm Brian Brushwood. I love each and every one of you on a deeply sexual level. Um, that's it for this episode of see this you next week. Tuesday. NSF WTF.